I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Andrew Price. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty, so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... Ashtar Galactic Command. What is the Ashtar Galactic Command? It's a conspiracy theory that spun out of one man's delusional ramblings of first contact with aliens. And after infighting and a 1970s mainstream news broadcast being hijacked by an unknown force, it was transformed into a religion. one. Time is either your enemy or your ally. Time moves on. It's a constant. Time erodes all. It's a universal persistence. It's something to either rebel against or make peace with. It also has this strange ability to make stories warp and change. This story in specific starts with a man named Frank Kritzer. In the late 1930s, Kritzer moved to Giant Rock, California, named as one might assume, for a gigantic rock that was predominantly displayed outside of Landers, California, and near a military base in 29 Palms. Kritzer, who was something of a would-be prospector, became inspired by a local tortoise who dug holes in order to keep themselves cool during the blazing desert summers. Being a bit of a recluse, he decided to spend his free time blasting away at the bottom of the aforementioned giant rock with, you guessed it, dynamite creating a livable mini catacomb for himself underneath the large rock structure. Kritzer lived out under Giant Rock for close to a decade. While spending his nights under the rock, he spent his days building a landing strip that quickly evolved into a do-it-yourself airport, averaging at least one plane a day by 1941. Eventually, Kritzer passed away, and his purported friend, George Van Trussell, took over the property and turned it into a fully functioning airport. He, his wife, and his three children moved out onto the land and opened a cafe, general store, and gas station. He ran these businesses from 1947 to roughly 1975. Can you imagine somebody coming and being like, oh yeah, um, you know, what? The, what's the history? What, you know, this is a really lovely airport you have. Um, what's the history of this airport? Like, you know, how was it built and stuff? Oh yeah, um, some guy just blew a bunch of holes under this rock and lived there. <laughs> like what a fu- what a fucking weird origin of this airport. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's really strange too cuz it's like how do those things collide? Like he moved out there to be a prospector and then he decided I'm just going to live under this massive rock. He like became Gollum and then he was like He was like, my precious, land your planes on my precious. (laughs) Yeah, it's so weird. It's so, so weird. And like Giant Rock is like, for people who don't live in California, like the two of us, Giant Rock is kind of like a institution. You know, there's like a lot of people go there a lot as a tourist destination. There's all these weird stories about it, some of which we're going to get into in this. And it's, it's just kind of a place that feels like it's always had weirdos there you know even now you know 50 years later or whatever but man i don't know that it ever got weirder even with some of the crazy shit that we're going to talk about that george van trussell did yeah i mean this is just that's just beyond weird because it's like forming a a gun a church that worships guns is weird but like blow a bunch of holes in the ground and live in catacombs for a decade is beyond that (laughs) Just think about what that person's childhood was like. Like, what happened to them to make them be like, you know what? Humanity? Nah. Social interaction? Nah. A healthy sex life? Nah. It's just me and my giant ass rock. Living in a network of underground catacombs in the dank darkness of a cave? The fucking Drake meme. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Yeah. It's so weird. It's so fucking weird. But, you know, before we, before we, uh, you know, we're not gonna, we're not, this episode isn't here to shit on our, on our dude, Mr. Kritzer. Oh, that guy, that guy got shit on by bats every day. Yeah, he really did. This, this episode, we're here to shit on a dude named George Van Trussell. So let's listen to 
some of the eloquent verbal stylings of old Boy George. If I knew any Boy George songs, I would make a Boy George reference here, but I don't. Karma, 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 Ashtar. You come to my airport. Please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please abduct me. I think this guy would definitely take offense to being called Boy George if he knew who he was. It was given to me by a man who landed a ship at my airport in 1953. And uh, we put this uh, formula under research, uh, tested a number of... Uh, experiments on a bench in a good electronics lab in Chicago and uh, we produced phenomenal results uh, with evidence that we should do it on a larger scale in order to be able to do more with it and uh, this evolved out of something that started in 1953 into a four-story high machine uh, that we're working on down there today. Now, George, um, I don't care whether the machine is four stories high or 40 stories high or four inches high. When I say calmly and unexcitedly, a time machine, what does your formula tell you you can do with a time machine? Well, Jack, uh, our formula has no time factor, which uh, electronic formula does have. And uh, on the other hand, uh, electronic science has only had two dimensions to work with, the electric pattern and the, the magnetic pattern perpendicular to it. And we discovered a third zone, which we call a time zone, uh, and we are uh, working through this zone with an effort to orient the magnetic field to give us uh, other results than our science can obtain at present. George, just double talk to me. A time machine means to me a little box that I can go into and go back 5,000 years or forward 10,000 years. Is that what your formula tells you you can do? Well, Jack, this isn't a little box. This is a, a four-story machine focusing fields that we can orient to produce this zone big enough for a man to get into. It isn't a box. But what happens to the man when he gets into the zone? I'm well, all agog with curiosity. Uh, Jack, we've discovered this zone is subject to thought. Now, since time doesn't record events uh, the way we do on calendars and clocks, you could only record an event by thinking of it. Now, theoretically, we believe we can take a videotape magnetic uh, camera into the time zone and photograph uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address or Caesar's Army's marching or anything that's ever happened. All right, let me get this straight. In other words, you're telling me like H.G. Wells imagined 50 years ago that everything that happened in time is still there to be seen by the recreation electronically of a thought which exists. Uh, Jack, uh, you know how you uh, talk into a tape on a tape recorder and play the interruptions back identical to the uh, play that you made. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is uh, the same way. You can put interruptions into it and play them back out of it. An associate of ours in uh, creating a magnetic coupler with this principle, coupled in the Earth's magnetic field and played back TV shows from stations that, don't, that aren't even in business anymore. Do you mean that an experiment has been done to bring out of the air television programs which have been and gone. Been and gone. Now, where was this experiment conducted? It was conducted in Santa Monica by... If this duo had teamed up to do late-night infomercials, I would buy anything from them. <laughs> well, Jack, uh, so, you know, you, know you, you, take your, you take a whole onion and you, uh, you put it inside of the Nutribullet and uh, you put the lid on. And, you know, what our team is finding is, uh, you know, the... the the velocity of the spinning blade, it, you know, if it goes fast enough, and then if you tap the top of it, um, it, it'll dice up your onions into tiny little bits. So let me get this straight. If you put your onions in this nutri bullet and you put the buttons down, it'll dice your onions. Well, uh, Jack, uh, what we're finding is that the, uh, velocity of the, of the onion chopping will actually create a, a, uh, an overall uh, slicing method that uh, what our scientists are basically discovering is that uh, it dices it and that's the end result. So what are you saying there? Well, uh, you know, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Jack. <laughs> Insta buy. Just like a guy, a guy saying any talking about 
a time machine with the casual formality of if he's talking about like how they like got a bird out of their house or something and then just an incredulous Scottish man. Wait, hold on a second. Now I'm just, I'm looking at his name and I'm like, is his name George Van Trussell or is it George Van Tussle? Hold on. I think I said it wrong. <laughs> this is George Van Tassel. George Van Tassel. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I said it wrong earlier in the script. So I apologize to the listeners of The Deep Cuts. We're officially on air making a correction. George Van Tassel is the guy's name. Well, Jack, we uh, formally apologize to the George Van Tassel estate for incorrectly naming him uh, George Van Trussell. So are you telling me that you said his name wrong the entire time? Well, Jack, uh, <coughs> I haven't tried out my Scottish accent since the Syllable and Brains episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. My my perfect Scottish accent is a little rusty. Um, How would you describe... George Van Tassel physically. We, we we get a sense of his character. He's very nonchalant about wondrous creations that definitely exist and aren't just things he's saying. But how do, how would you describe him? Yeah, I mean he's just he's just a sixties guy. He's just a he's a sixties dude in his in his uh or a, a not a sixties, um a fifties guy or early sixties. He's a mid century guy in his like late 40s he's got the classic bald top with the hair on the sides he looks like he sells insurance yeah i would say he's like if you took john mccain and then instead of having him become a kind of centrist republican war hero uh just radicalized him with bizarro youtube videos about psychic messages and alien visitation which i would vote for same Um, so, you know, George Van Tassel's story has kind of evolved at various points over the course of his life. You know, like he, for a while, is really obsessed with this idea of time travel and and he kind of develops this very long and elaborate story about time travel. Then it kind of shifts. Between his weird esoteric description of time travel and the fucking guy living in the catacombs. It's like, this is some, this is some fucking Shane Carruth shit. This would make a great Shane Carruth movie. I would watch that movie. Um, but you know, he, he becomes, it's almost kind of like he like fixates on these weird conspiracy theories and just kind of like dives into them for years at a time. And they kind of become his central idea for a while. It's time travel for a while. It's being visited by an alien spacecraft. Um, and then eventually the two stories become one. And then he says that. The alien spacecraft came to give him the information about time travel. Um, so what you're telling me is that the alien gave you the, the time machine. <laughs> <coughs> let's, uh, let's listen to this, uh, this uh, little section of this video from the same interview where he, <coughs> you're going to kill yourself doing this. No wonder, uh, Sean Connery died. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jack, the formula came from a ship that landed at my airport in 1953 on August the 24th, uh, which had four people aboard it that came from another planet. I'm breathless. Well, you're not only breathless, I was breathless. But I'm cynical, too. Well, that's fine. That's the way to be. In fact, I'm a bigger skeptic than you are of many things. I'm an unbeliever. Convince me that this really happened to you. Well, uh, this this thing is very similar to a thing that happened in our biblical records where uh, a lord presented Moses with a pattern to build a tabernacle. He, they came out of the sky, they handed him stone tablets, and this phenomena that's taking place today is as old as our history, as our civilization. This isn't anything new that's occurring, it's something that's uh, being continued in another time of crisis when uh, conditions affecting the people of this planet are reaching a point where somebody has to take care of the situation. Now, I don't intend in any way to be disrespectful or blasphemous, but do you feel, and I know you're not an evangelistic type, do you feel that you're some kind of Moses receiving a new word? Well, I don't don't, uh, say that, Jack. I say that what is occurring now has occurred before. There's many records of these ships landing throughout history, clear back into Sanskrit. And uh, there are records in uh, the 1898 Chicago newspapers that covered the front page for three days of a big ship setting over Chicago. When you realize we're dealing with a, with a type of man that is as, 
almost as far above us in intelligence as we are above the lower animals, uh, there isn't anything phenomenal in this at all. Now, you say casually, because this is your life's work now, uh, ships. Now, you mean flying saucer, don't you? Well, a flying saucer was a name the press put on this thing. And actually, what they termed a flying saucer was nothing but a scout ship from the big carriers. But I want to go back to that night in 1953. Tell me, where did this happen for people who, who, who haven't had you talk or seen you yet? It happened uh, on my airport, which I've operated for the last 16 years, uh, at Giant Rock Airport, 17 miles north of Yucca Valley in California, mm -hmm. or 40 miles north of Palm Springs. Now, this is a private airport for small aircraft, is it? This is an airport used both by the military and private uh, aircraft. You own this airport, do I lease this airport from the United States government. I've operated it for 16 years since I retired from the flight test business in the aviation. Right now. How old are you now, by the way, George? I'm 54, Jack. Got uh, three grown daughters married and 11 grandchildren. You don't mind if I ask you the stock question? I know that you've been asked every obnoxious question that can ever have been asked. You've never been treated for any form of emotional upset. I've never had any emotional upset other than women. Except that night in Yucca Flats, and not Yucca Flats, a giant rock. When this uh... Men would rather concoct an elaborate conspiracy theory about how an alien landed at their airport and gave them the schematics to a time machine than go to therapy. Also, I, I'm just, I, I would buy anything from these guys. I would buy anything from these guys. Like I, if I watch the rest of this, I'm gonna become an Ashtar fucking follower. So you're telling me <laughs> that, that on your airport, <laughs> An alien landed, and he gave you a time machine. Well, Jack, you know I, uh, you know these things have been documented for decades. You know we've seen these 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 crafts land through all the way back to Sanskrit, and you know it's just it's just common sense that this stuff is just factually happening as, as we speak. There's an alien outside; he's coming inside. I can hear him. He's walking in the door, and he's gonna sit down and start talking to us. So you're telling me that this alien is going to walk right into the room right now? Well, Jack, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Call into QVC right now, the one eight hundred three six five QVC time to get the uh, the the new Ginsu knives. They cut through cans, and um, they're the preferred knives of time traveling aliens. So you're telling me I can cut through a shoe with this knife, even an alien shoe? Well, Jack, of course, you know, alien shoes are made out of the strongest material that man hasn't even harnessed yet because we've never seen these types of materials. And, you know, a regular knife can cut right through these things and nothing happens. They just form back together. But with a Ginsu knife, you cut through an alien shoe, it disappears into the f fucking 16th century. You know, it travels back in time. So you're telling me forty nine ninety nine is all I have to pay and this could be mine. Well, you know, Jack, you, you know, forty nine ninety nine. you know, of course, we know from centuries of knowledge that, you know, whenever, you know, just one more cent and it's fifty dollars. But the thing about it is when it's forty nine ninety nine, it's actually cheaper. It actually, you know, it's one cent less, which, you know, doesn't seem like much when you put it in that way. But when you see forty nine ninety nine, that seems like a lot less than fifty dollars. So, you know, if you just pay forty nine ninety nine, you're paying a lot less than fifty bucks, which, you know, the other knives that don't cut through alien shoes are that's that's a that's a, you know, a solid fifty bucks, which is way more. So, you know, so you're telling me forty nine ninety nine is actually one penny less. Then fifty dollars. Well, you know, Jack. Of course, we know that you know pennies are made out of of copper, and they've been made out of copper since the beginning. And we know that copper was a was a material that we did not actually harvest from the land, like these other materials, like ore and and gold and silver. We actually got them from aliens. Aliens landed at my airport, and they brought copper, and they said, "Here's this new material for these magical coins that you can make." And you know, one single penny, if you make it out of copper. It'll be worth uh, 20 times the amount of earth metal. So it's actually worth 20 times more than gold. So if you get rid of one penny, that, that's a fortune of a deal. 1-800, buy now. <laughs> I would buy anything. Believe it or not, George Van Tassel claims to have met an alien life form that appeared down at his airport's landing strip in the early 1950s. He claims to have met a man who took him on board the craft, which was around 18 feet in diameter. After boarding the vehicle, he was greeted by three additional men, each approximately 5 feet 6 inches. 
Tassel said the men appeared to be human when he asked the main character that he was interacting with. The man who looked no more than 28 years old confessed that he was almost 700 years of age and that they had been traveling to Earth in order to deliver the secret of time travel. The most sought-after mathematical equation in all of mankind's history? F equals 1 over T. George Van Tassel would go on to make wild claims that there was even a moon base that had existed on the surface of the planetoid from the 1950s till today. Yo, we gotta go to this planet. We gotta go to this planet with these other beings. We gotta fucking give them a time machine. It'll be it'll be fucking hilarious. We go give these guys time machines. And we'll be like, oh, you need this time machine. It's for the fate of humanity. These dudes immediately, they'll, like, go back and, like, murder their own moms or something. Like, they'll just do some weird shit, and we can just watch. It'll be fucking hilarious. I don't know, man. That sounds like that breaks a whole bunch of, like, space-time continuum laws, butterfly space-time effect. I don't know. Bro, it'll be fucking hilarious. All right, fuck it. Get in. Let's go. George then attempted to start a business in order to build this fabled time machine. He struggled to accrue the proper personnel and funding for years. Then, in 1963, Van Tassel had a second interaction with a purported alien life form. One man in a standard-issue Cadillac drove onto Van Tassel's airstrip late at night. The man interacted and performed for 19 witnesses, attempting to prove that he was, in fact, extraterrestrial in origin. According to the witnesses in attendance, the man used a small device fixed to his belt to make himself disappear and then reappear. I want to I want to pick apart this company thing for a second because we talk about we we on many an episode obviously we talked about this idea of of kayfabe and the kayfabe of, of the personality and the way that people present themselves and we talk a lot about weird grifters and snake oil salesmen and people who, you know, craft lies and build up these stories for, you know, whatever various means to an end for them, whether it's financial gain or or whatever. Um, and we always kind of like kind of end up uh, dissecting that aspect of people. And, you know, sometimes or often it, feel, it feels to me like the narrative is pretty clear, like it's pretty easy to look at it from the outside in and be like, OK, I, I get this person. I understand what's going on here. There's they're doing this because they want this. They they've created this idea that the earth is flat because they feel insignificant based on the larger narrative about us being this insignificant speck in space with no rhyme or reason and then this makes them feel more special and significant and it kind of jives with like mainstream religion a little bit more. And you know, all these various stories. But sometimes something will come out of, no, of nowhere and I just kind of can't wrap my mind around what the deal is. Like, what is the intention here? What were they going for? And uh, the Stardust Ranch is a little bit like that, where it's like, why the fuck is this guy doing this? But I guess what we kind of ended up coming up with is that he was just fucking bored and retired. But it's like, what is the deal with this, like, starting a company? Because he's like, he he actually tried to put together a company to build this time machine. He attempted to get funding to do this. And he attempted to hire employees to execute on this time machine building. So, like, was that all just this weird kayfabe thing where it was all bullshit? And he, like, what was his, what was his goal in that? Or... Like, did he really think that he could build a time machine? And the other part of that, too, is like, he claims in this interview that it it's over four stories tall. That doesn't exist. That's a lie. That never happened. So, like, did he ever really try and start the company? I don't know. But I've seen multiple sources saying that he did. So I have no idea. But then there's also a thing later where he builds a device called the Integratron, which we'll get to. But... Part of me wonders if the Integratron started out as, in air quotes, a time travel device. Yeah, it's just interesting because it's like a lot of these conspiracy theories and these grifters who come up with these stories and these conspiracy theories and claims and things like that. Like a large aspect of it is kind of like doing the opposite of this, like obfuscating what their claims are and avoiding proof or proving things or being proven wrong by these manipulative, uh, these manipulative circumnavigations of the truth and like, oh, like 
I'll, you know, I'll, I'll never allow myself to get backed into this corner because then I would have to admit that I was lying or I wouldn't be able to prove anything. So I'm, I'm just kind of avoid that. But this is almost like the opposite of that, where it's like, I'm actually like to actually try to start a company to build the time machine. If you're just a grift or liar, that seems like just the furthest from the direction you want to go in. You would think, but then also he's fucking cuckoo. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, but it, but it's just it, but it's like cuckoo in a different way because you know, like completely different way. Like you know, like Sophia Stewart, like she she goes out of her way to throw subterfuge into her story in every aspect. She's always uh, circumnavigating the truth and avoiding being like put into situations where she has to like, <laughs> my God, yeah, ba- Ashtar is coming for you. He's, you are. You are bis. You you are blaspheming me. Glimp glomp and glorm clomp from the other episode about aliens came back to my home dimension and told me what a dick you are. <laughs> they also said that your supposition that greys are nonviolent is very reductive, and you've boiled them down into harmful stereotypes, and that all life forms are multifaceted and can be both capable of peaceful behavior, scientific study and exploration, and be violent. We are not a monolith. Remember that one time that I traveled back in time and had sex with your mom and I'm actually your father. Bro, I told you that shit was, would be hilarious. Um, but yeah, you know, somebody like Sophia Stewart, who just goes out of her way to ever be put into a situation where she would have to like prove something. And so she's just throwing shit left and right. Just. And, but but to just be like, oh, I'm going to actually try to get funding to start a company. I mean, it, it failed, obviously, so it didn't work. Or, and like you said, maybe he's fucking lying. But if he really did try to start a company, that would be such a terrible idea because you would you would be getting funding from investors who would expect some kind of results that you obviously could not deliver because it's not real. It's not real? Blasphemy. Those were my personal schematics I gave him. George Van Tassel parlayed these claims into becoming one of the newly blossoming UFO communities, founding fathers of fringe conspiracies. He created arguably the most prominent UFO group established in the United States in the late 1950s. I know that we have a band already called the Dead Boy Detectives, but can we start a, another band? Called the Ministry of Universal Wisdom? That too. Well, okay. A third, a third, that's our third band. But can we start another band that's like a, a an early '90s um, competitor to the presidents of the United States of America called the Founding Fathers of Fringe Conspiracies? I mean, yeah, I like that better. And then the first album would just be called Ministry of Wisdom of Universal Wisdom. Yeah, so he started this thing called the Ministry of Us- Universal uh, Wisdom. And we could, oh, and we could be called we could be called Fofo. That could be that that could be that could be the shortening. This organization investigated and collected evidence of the UFO phenomenon. But mostly, it just interviewed copious amounts of, at the time, what were referred to as contactees. Due to radio and television appearances, Van Tassel had become arguably the most well-known promoter of the idea of first contact. Surprisingly, he became a minor celebrity throughout the 1950s. In many ways, the fact that we associate missing time, beams of light, and ships from other worlds finding their way to Earth come largely from his work. In 1952, Van Tassel claimed to have received psychic messages from a telepathic communication of extraterrestrial origin from a being called Ashtar. This source became the first metaphysical superstar of the flying saucer age. Ashtar began to develop quite a following within the UFOlogy world. So we're going to now look at some paintings um, and book art cover uh, artwork. Um of Ash- Ashtar, um, Andrew, how would you describe this second painting here in the doc in the, the, the script? Um, how w- how would you describe this this character, um, commonly referred to by his followings as Ashtar Shuren? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, the 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 deep cut for those in the know, uh, it, he looks exactly like Zex Marquis from Gundam Wing, but he looks like Beta Cook Triple H. <laughs> yeah, so these these uh paintings of Ashtar all kind of have this common thread of 
weird digital artwork, airbrushing, kind of bizarre Jesus-like portraiture, space fields. And his features are kind of androgynous or maybe a little bit feminine where he has longer blonde hair, um, a a thin kind of um, angular nose, center-oriented features, wide set blue eyes, um, and he is holding up his right hand in what would normally be something we would refer to as the stigmata. But in this case, there is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pointed interdimensional star manifesting uh, over his hand and on his kind of space military blue uniform. There are multiple like crystal pendants. Is this is this kind of the the visage of him that was developed by Van Tassel? No, this stuff came later. Oh, because I was gonna say I was like, because you know this is this is such a very specific look, and I, I guess what I'm saying is just not applicable at all if this wasn't him. But I was thinking just that this is such a specific look that like to create a character in the 1950s looking the way that Van Tassel looked, especially that looks like this almost seems like it's like just a repressed 1950s dude just like power fantasy about wishing that he could just like fucking let go and get rid of his toxic masculinity and be more of a just cool dude and like the 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 slight fringe counterculture of of hippies that started to crop up in the early 60s like it was just some person some guy just being like in the back of his mind like i wish i could be like that but i can't because you know i'm a a 50s guy (laughs) yeah um the answer to that to your question will will be coming very shortly van tassel also took it upon himself to reinterpret the christian bible in terms of extraterrestrial intervention He eventually went on to claim that Jesus was a space alien in disguise. The Ministry of Universal Wisdom reported that all of humanity had the ability to access higher spiritual planes, dubbed as the universal mind of God, which facilitates evolutionary processes. Van Tassel pointed to Jesus and Ashtar as prime examples of this. Bro, okay, I'm getting kind of tired of the time machine thing. They've gone back, they've fucked their moms... It's, it was hilarious. I'm over it. Go down there, put on one of those weird robes that they wear, and tell them that you are like some kind of god. And just, and, and tell them, just like stab a, a hole in your hand. Why would I do that? Just fucking do it. Just stab yourself in your hand. Go down there and just be like, just walk around and just start turning fucking water into fermented grape juice. You're insane. Trust me, it's gonna be fucking hilarious. Just tell, like, let him kill you, or th- and then come back to life, and then just leave. Bro, are you on space mushrooms right now? Yes, of course I am. But trust me, it'll be hilarious. All right, fine. To make things even more interesting, Van Tassel eventually went on to claim that once an individual had mastered the universal mind, they could channel messages from not only Ashtar and other aliens, but deceased humans, such as Nikola Tesla. (laughs) Tell him you're Nikola Tesla. All right, just shut up, shut up, shut up. It's it's on, don't say anything. Oh, hello. Is this the the accent of Nikola Tesla? I'm over here in the afterlife, uh, making neon signs. Bro, that was weak. I don't know, I don't know. I, I don't fucking know anything about Nikola Tesla. Uh, (laughs) While psychically communicating with Nikola Tesla, George Van Tassel claimed to receive a blueprint that he would eventually title the Integratron. Here, give me the fucking walkie-talkie. I'll do this. You suck at being Nikola Tesla. Uh, Sorry about that. That was was some interference. Uh, So anyway, um, you should build this thing called the, uh, what is it called? Uh, I don't know, the... Integratron? What? I don't fucking know. Alright, fine. The Integratron! It's, uh, it fucking makes you live forever? Let me get this straight. It's called the Integratron. And you can get it for $49.99. (laughs) Bro, they're selling it on QVC. This shit's fucking hilarious. 
So the the Integratron is this large white dome structure that he ended up building. This device was reportedly a combination of alien technology and human technology that would extend lifespans and allow access to knowledge from the past and the future. It was built with a series of donations from wealthy members of Von Tassel's inner circle and also a sizable contribution from wait for it Howard Hughes old piss jar himself old old Kleenex foot Hughes it's just uh it, it's just fucking um Leonardo DiCaprio coming in and he's like I'm here and I I'm the real Howard Hughes not a time traveling uh not a time traveling actor preparing for a role and just really committed to this. I am Howard Hughes. I will give you money right now from Howard Hughes. It's a check I'm writing to you from Howard Hughes. And it just cuts to the aliens who are playing all these pranks. And they're just like, bro, they, they took this to a weird place. Like, I did not see this coming. I did not see the guy from Inception going back in time and dressing up like Howard Hughes and conning them into thinking that he was funding their fucking device. I'm here as part of a, a deeply researched method acting practice. I'm here because I want that Oscar. <laughs> the ultimate method acting is actually going back in time and like <laughs> knocking out the real guy and sticking him in a closet and then just living his life for a while. They call that the Shane Carruth. <laughs> but like in doing that, he <laughs> it, while he was method acting as Howard Hughes, he just went and funded a life extending time machine. <laughs> I have keen visionary instincts. I'm here. Also, my Howard Hughes impression just sounds like George W. Bush. Yeah, it's it's a it's a hybrid between. It's not quite. It's not deep enough to be G W. So it's like it's somewhere between G W. and Ross Perot. Yeah, it really is. Can I finish? Can I finish? I'm here for the time travel uh, Integratron seminar. Can I finish? <laughs> Howard Hughes, D- Leonardo DiCaprio as Howard Hughes and Ross Perot went back in time to fund the Integratron. <laughs> <laughs> Can I finish? I'm, gonna, I'm in between a rock and a hard place here, okay? I'm not going to win this election, okay? We got to go back in time and change some shit. Butterfly effect this bitch because I need to be president, okay? Can I finish? Bro, we have irreversibly ruined this timeline, the effects of which will probably not be seen for decades, but will eventually probably end up with Donald Trump becoming the president of the United States. But this shit is hilarious. Hey everybody, my name is Hilsmer Spacha Demon, the Space Hell Demon, and Andrew and Dave are forcing me to- What are you talking about, Hilsmer? Nobody is forcing you to do anything. You literally barged in here in the middle of me recording this promo and insisted that you do it. You said that I sucked at it and you could do it so much better than me. Yeah, exactly. I'm being forced to do it because you suck so much at your job. So anyway, Andrew and Dave are forcing me to get on the microphone today and kind of go over a bunch of the cool deep cut stuff that's going on right now. So first and foremost, Dave is coming out with a new Pixie Box book which I guess are apparently called comics now, all of a sudden. But uh, yeah, the book is called Everyone is Tulip, and it's coming out June 29th, available in all sh- comic stores and stores in general, I guess. And uh, it's it's written by Dave, and it's drawn by Nicole Gu, and it's colored by Ellie Hall. And it's basically about an aspiring actress who moves to L.A. to try to make it big, and then she ends up sort of doing these weird experimental performance art YouTube videos and gets mixed in with this sort of identity shattering underbelly of Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, so that that book is coming out uh, June 29th and you can actually read the entire thing by going to everyoneistulip.com where they're releasing the book page by page as a webcomic leading up to the release of it. Also, you can get official Deep Cuts merch by going to deepcutspod.com and clicking on the shop or you can go to bit.ly.com slash deep cuts merch and you can get t-shirts, you can get hats, you can get coffee mugs, you can get baby onesies. You can also get a mystery treehouse investigation agency patch that you can put on a backpack or put on your jacket uh, by going to deepcutspod.com and going to the shop. Or you can actually get that at Dave's shop at heydavebaker.com or you can get it at Andrew's shop at dapricerights.com. 
You should also follow Deep Cuts on YouTube by searching Deep Cuts, where we are going to be releasing some cool, interesting, long-form video in the coming months. You can follow Deep Cuts on Facebook, where Dave and Andrew put out these like reaction videos where they watch old movies and kind of react to them. You can also join the Facebook group, which is a group where a bunch of Deep Cuts listeners go to kind of hang out and talk about episodes or talk about random, interesting subjects. A lot of episodes are kind of born in that group. There's a lot of memes that happen there. It seems like a just a fun place for fucking nerds that like this bullshit would hang out. You can follow Deep Cuts on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse, where they do short form explainers. So if there's an idea that's like not long enough or in depth enough to do like a full episode on, they'll do like three minute explainers on TikTok. You can also check out all the different books and projects that Andrew and Dave are releasing on their websites, dapricerights.com and heydavebaker.com, where they put out comics and books and video projects and anything else they're doing outside of the Deep Cuts world, such as Dave's books, Fuck Off Squad and Action Hospital, or Andrew's book, Deadbolt AI Private Eye. And finally, if you go to deepcutspod.com and scroll to the bottom to sign up for the mailing list, you'll receive a semi-regular newsletter called the Mystery Treehouse Investigation Agency Circular, which collects all the news and new content that Andrew and Dave are putting out and kind of puts it in one place, as well as provides some more commentary, and maybe in the future there might be some cool behind-the-scenes info that's going to be released there. There. Are you fucking happy? Once again, Hillsmer, you didn't need to do that. You insisted, and in fact, I would have preferred to do it. Is that the thanks I get? Get out of here. Act 2, The Guy Who Created It. Von Tassel's following within the UFO community gained such prominence that he eventually held conventions and weekly, quote-unquote, channeling sessions at his giant rock airport. These weekly channeling sessions would allow his followers to ask questions and channel answers from extraterrestrials. These meetings eventually evolved into an annual meeting called the Giant Rock Spacecraft Convention, which was organized by Van Tassel. It lasted for close to 24 years, occurring annually. At one point, the number of people attending the convention ballooned to 11,000. Most of the well-known UFO contactees were speakers at the convention, or held channeling sessions themselves, attempting to psychically connect to the extraterrestrial life forms from across the galaxy that had previously interacted with them. As George Van Tassel's following grew, the cultural interest in UFOs increased. He would often speak he would often speak of his connections with Ashtar and deliver new pieces of the puzzle in order to attempt to facilitate humanity's evolution to a higher plane of psychic existence. Ashtar, however, did not stay as a character exclusive to George Van Tassel's ensemble. He quickly integrated into the wider UFO culture. Robert Short, a pseudonym for the writer Bill Rose, who was the editor for the 1950s UFO magazine, Interplanetary News Digest, also began to popularize the character of Ashtar. The two men had a disagreement, eventually, about how Ashtar would be portrayed, and Short broke away from George Van Tassel's organization and began his own version of the story, which he coined Ashtar Command. Is there any more, is there any more definitive proof that the conspiracy theory or the religion that you buy into is total bullshit? Then that the guy who started it took the idea from the guy who created it. But the reason why he split off from him is because he disagreed with him about the character, like the guy who created it. He's like, no, Ashtar isn't like that. He's like, I fucking created this shit. This is my shit. Like, I'm the one that fucking met him. And he's like, no, he's different. You don't know him like I know him. Like, is there any, if, is there any bigger indication that this is total bullshit than just like, yeah, uh, the guy who created this, uh, he, that's, 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 that's a bad vibe. Like, I don't like, I don't like the way he's talking about his hair. He's saying he has a, a buzz cut. I think you should have like flowing blonde locks that are kind of like slick back Andrew WK style. That's not the real Ashtar. It's like, oh, so this is all just total bullshit because you're disagreeing with the guy who created him. Ashtar Command evolved as its own separate movement that had no definitive leader. It became a pseudo New Age religion, which incorporated many of the elements of both Short and Van Tassel's vision, involving a complex mythology of multiple tiered alien life forms who were visiting Earth in order to attempt to assist us in achieving access to the fifth dimension 
this new religion was propelled forward at a rate at a rapid rate in 1977 when a standard news broadcast in the UK was hijacked by a disembodied voice and it said this over the airwaves this is the voice of Freelon, a representative of the Ashtar Galactic Command speaking to you for many years you have seen us as lights in the sky we speak to you now in peace and wisdom as we have done to your brothers and sisters all over this, your planet Earth. We come to warn you of the destiny of your race and your world so that you may communicate to your fellow being the course you must take to avoid the disaster which threatens your world. And the beings on our worlds around you, this is in order that you may share in the Great Awakening. As the planet passes into the new age of Aquarius, the new age can be a time of great peace and evolution for your race but only if your rulers are made aware of the evil forces that can overshadow their judgments. Be still now and listen, for your chance may not come again. All your weapons of evil must be removed. The time for conflict is now past, and the race of which you are part of may proceed to the higher stages of its evolution if you show yourselves worthy to do this. You have but a short time to learn to live together in peace and goodwill. Small groups all over the planet are learning this and exist to pass on the light of the dawning new age to you all. You are free to accept or reject their teachings, but only those who learn to live in peace will pass to the higher realms of spiritual evolution. Be aware of the voice of Rilon, a representative of the Ashtar Galactic Command, speaking to you. Be aware also that there are many false prophets and guides at present operating on your world. They will suck your energy from you the energy you call money and will put it to evil ends and give you the worthless dross in return. Your inner divine self will protect you from this. You must learn to be sensitive to the voice within that can tell you what is truth and what is confusion, chaos and untruth. Learn to listen to your truth which is within you and you will lead yourselves onto the path of evolution. This is our message to our dear friends. We have watched you growing for many years as you too have watched our lights in your skies. You know now that we are here, and that there are more beings on and around your Earth than your scientists admit. We are deeply concerned about you and your path towards the light, and will do all we can to help you. Have no fear. Seek only to know yourselves, and live in harmony with the ways of your planet Earth. We here at the Ashtar Galactic Command thank you for your attention. We are now leaving the planes of your existence. May you be blessed by the supreme love and truth of the cosmos. <laughs> Bro, do you think they bought it? <laughs> yeah. That was fucking great, man. That voice. That was perfect. Bro, that was fucking hilarious. This bizarre and uncredited public prank caused a massive uptick in interest in Ashtar. The faith is mainly concerned with following the teachings of Sananda, who was the original alien who was reincarnated as Jesus. Ashtar is the commander of an intergalactic fleet of ships, tasked with propelling humanity into a higher state of psychic consciousness. While Sananda is the ultimate deity of the UFO-themed faith that grew out of George Van Tassel's ideas, Ashtar is the most prominent of the characters within the pseudo-faith. The group once again rebranded themselves, now donning the name the Ashtar Galactic Command. Continuing up into the mid-1990s, the somewhat disconnected groups associated with the Ashtar Galactic Command slowly began pooling their resources and attempting to align their stories. They slowly organized a channeling conglomerate in order to disseminate and populate their beliefs into the wider population. They attempted to unify the movement by establishing a single authoritative source for all Ashtarian messages. This ultimately had an unexpected effect. There was a significant rise in the New Age spiritualism side of their community. Due to this coming together of the disparate groups, they were largely able to iron out the conflicting stories and failed prophecies that had previously existed within Ashtarian mythology. It was also decided that for individual channelers espousing messages that focused on ideas of destruction of the earth, conspiracies about extraterrestrial evolution, or a general fear-mongering, that they would be excommunicated. A council of true believers was established that would form an orthodoxy for approving quote-unquote accepted Ashtar messages. Ultimately, there were 12 guidelines established that would facilitate a message being incorporated into the ongoing and developing Ashtar mythology. However, the main criteria was that the channeler operated on a higher level of soul 
So how much of that is just completely fucking stupid? All of it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love, though, that you, that they were kind of like, we got to get our fucking story straight. We got to set some sort of editorial review board. This psychic channeling alien messages shit is just too easy for anybody to do. We got to come up with some sort of means of codifying this shit. So we're going to come up with these 12 guidelines. And then also we're going to have an arbitrary meter of if someone is of a of a higher level of soul. You know, that we can just say, oh, that person isn't that person's lying. They're not of an accurate level of soul. Yeah, I mean, it. It's, it's really interesting because, you know, this, this, this particular story obviously is very f- kind of lighthearted and funny and, you know, feels fairly inconsequential. It's just this goofy thing where these just people made up this weird bullshit for just because they thought it would, they, they get some kind of weird fast uh, satisfaction out of like pretending like they're the arbiters of this message from space or whatever. Um, and they seem to be these kind of like new agey people that have these like environmentalist, anti-war, anti-violence messages that they just kind of want to like generically pipe out into the world. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it's interesting to look at these things. And the thing that popped out to me is like the fact that in that, in that message that was, that was broadcast, the, the, the phrase great awakening was in it, which is a term that is used in QAnon. Uh, the great awakening is the idea of all of these people being, uh, brought to the truth by Q and this mass, um, this mass amount of people learning the reality of our world and these sinister things that are going on and banding together to stop it. And just that phrase great awakening is just used a lot it's one of the tenets of of it and kind of what you're talking about where they this way of trying to canonize everything and being like oh we got to get our story straight we got to come up with a bunch of rules we got to make sure that no just any person can't just like show up and just start saying shit um and just claiming that they talk to ashtar we have to like create some kind of purity test so that we can say whether or not somebody's legit or not so that people can't just co-opt this and it's interesting to look at these and a lot of other conspiracy theories and fledgling religions and stuff like that um, and weird scams and things like that. Like the the fucking this whole thing that happened like during the Iraq war where there was this thing called like a lot of people started saying that if you invested in buying the Iraqi currency dinars that were like the, 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 the Iraqi currency had tanked um, in, in the midst of the Iraq war, like towards the end of it, whenever fucking Saddam Hussein, Hussein was like hiding out in holes and shit. And whenever they found him and killed him, the, their currency had just like tanked to where it was like worthless. And so all these weird, like influencer people started cro- popping up. And they were just grifters and they were just like, if you if you invest heavily in this Iraqi currency, once they've removed Saddam Hussein and installed a an American approved new leader, the the it's just going to skyrocket. It's going to rebound to being worth what it what once was. So you're all going to get rich. You're going to like and so people would just buy hundreds of thousands of dollars in this currency through these like gurus who would like charge for seminars on how to invest it and all the, and like all these different things. And it it was, it was a scam. It wasn't true. It was like, it just wasn't, it was just a bunch of scammer grifters, like tricking people into buying seminars and taking fees for helping them invest in all this bullshit. And, and there's all these other scams and conspiracy theories and beliefs and all these things. And it's, but it's interesting to see them all as like, almost like, works in progress that built to QAnon where you can see people like trying to work out like how do you start one of these things like oh yeah and like you know with this one the Ashtar thing they're like oh yeah you have to create some kind of cipher so that you can keep control of the narrative and not let anybody co-opt it and then you see that perfected in QAnon to where they they kind of figured out that um if you made everything vague enough and if you kind of messaged these key things and got these rules straight, 
and really indoctrinated people to these these rules, then it kind of didn't matter who said anything. Like people could come in and claim that they were Q, but it didn't really matter because the message was really the important thing. And they really hammered that down. And it's just it's just interesting to see that where, you know, not to try to like take this and turn it dark or whatever. But it's interesting to look at these, look at the fact that like throughout our civilization, these conspiracy theories and cults and weird little fringe religions, just they crop up and they in cycles over and over again. And they're mostly harmless. But then you look back at them in, in, in the more meta sense, you can see them all as like trial runs and they, and people just kept trying and hitting a wall and trying and hitting a wall and trying and hitting a wall and tweaking something here, trying it again, tweaking something there. It always ends in either like, it always ends in either Jonestown where they fucking all kill themselves or it ends in like nothing. It just fizzles out and people stop giving a shit about it. But they're all just these weird little experiments. And there's a tweak here and then another experiment. And then eventually it all just kind of coalesced into this one thing that actually stuck. It actually had real life effects that were damaging and it actually cemented itself as something that's just not going to go away. And that's really, it's really interesting to look at it like that. Yeah. I think the other thing that's really fascinating about specifically the Ashtar Galactic Command stuff is how it is you can trace its origin so clearly to UFO stuff. And while UFO, you know, UFOlogy and, and cryptids, they share a lot of common interests for people who partake in those fields of study, in air quotes, the New Age religion crystals, you know, improving yourself mentally through meditation crowd, they don't, they don't really intersect. You know what I mean? Like, People who are into um, Reiki and uh, sound healing are not traditionally also obsessed with, you know, uh, Barney and Betty Hill, the the first um, commonly attributed abductees in the in the United States. And the fact that this specific cult slash religion slash grift slash one man's attempt to like low key, you know, corner the market on UFO, the UFO hobby, I guess, is it's just really interesting that it that it kind of like pivots and evolves into that, and that it has all these very f- public weird things where he became a he became like a celebrity. He was on TV talking about all this stuff like a good thirty years before the idea of you know alien abductees was in the pop culture. Um, organizing these conventions and then also like very tangibly profiting off of it, you know, like running these businesses, an airport that it's, oh, wow, you own an airport and that airport is the airport where the aliens showed up. Well, I got to go check that out. Oh, and you have a gas station there that you can sell me gas for my car ride that I've taken from across the country. Oh, wow. Oh, and you have a cafe that I can eat food at and pay money to to hang out in oh all right oh you run a little bed and breakfast oh you also you're you're a bank too just let me give you all my money like it it's so funny how a lot of these things turn into grifts but this one is just it's like he was a small business owner who was like we ain't getting any uh, customers we need to come up with a crazy story to get some people out here and then it spawned a religion <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that that is that's crazy, and I know I keep saying this, but we're going to talk about that specific thing a lot in the Q and on episodes. But it's just insane. Just in, just in short, in summary, here we've talked about this before on previous episodes as well. But it's just insane that these things happen where somebody in some period of time just isolated from anything else, just in a specific moment in time, did something or said something because they were just trying to make some money. And then for people just decades down the road to take these things that were said in this specific moment in time that were just a means to an end in the past, in this one specific moment where they were just like, oh, I'm just going to do this because I think it'll get people to come out to our airport or like, I'm just going to do this because I want to make some money and get a little famous right now. Or I'm just going to do this because I'm trying to get people to like vote in the midterm elections. And then for that to get taken completely out of context and used and interpreted to spawn these huge things that are like religions and cults and belief structures 
is absolutely insane. Like the fact that the fact that like Van Tassel canonized things like missing time and all these other tropes of of um, UFO and alien encounters. And then a religion was created based on this thing he made up when he it was just a marketing campaign of just like a like a a, a fucking like used car salesman just being like, I know what'll get people to come out to the old airport. Like that's just that's unreal. It's mind boggling and it uh, it's fascinating. And I feel like George Van Tassel is somebody that we could do eight hours on if we really wanted to unpack all of the weird ass shit. Like we only touched on like half of the stuff that he was involved in, like even just organizing the first UFO conventions the idea of the Integratron, which he fully built out there in the fucking desert. Um, like, there's just so many bizarre things that this guy did. Yeah. And it was just because he wanted, he was trying to get some foot foot traffic out of his weird airport that was built on top of a bunch of catacombs that some crazy man was living in. Yeah. In Hollywood, I think they call that a hat on a hat. Um, but we call that an Ashtar on an Ashtar. And on that note, today, the Ashtar Galactic Command is a fringe entity, populated mostly by hucksters and New Age salesmen, wannabe prophets, and the odd UFO enthusiast. What once sprung out of the heart of the burgeoning new frontier of alien life and exploration has now evolved into a sideshow snake oil salesman pavilion. Ultimately, none of George Van Tassel's predictions came true. His search for alien life and time travel have largely been fruitless, but his greatest creation has outlived well past his death. That creation? Not Ashtar or the Ashtar Galactic Command, but the network of individuals fascinated with the possibility of life on alien worlds. Life that might just be here on Earth. Life that might just be interested in us. Welcome back to Planet Glorp Glop, my scouts. Oh, uh, hey. Hey there, Supreme Leader. What's what's going on, man? Ah, uh, welcome. Uh, I, I trust that the, the, the scouting and exploration of the planet uh, Earth went well. Yeah, yeah. Knocked it out. Just nailed it. We we went. We explored. You know, we didn't uh, we didn't reveal ourselves or anything. We didn't we didn't meddle in our affairs. We we did it. Ah, good. Yes, that's that's uh, that's good because of course you know by the doctrine of planet Gorplop and all of our explorations that we cannot under any circumstances meddle with or otherwise interact with the with the life forms that we are studying. Read the read the doctrines. Memorized them. Never, never in my life would I do that. Oh, hmm, that's interesting, because um, we actually have a team of secondary scouts that were following you and, and uh, tracking the things that you were doing. What? Yes, uh, we've noticed some suspicious behaviors by the two of you, and so we decided to send a secondary scouting unit to watch you and see what you were doing. That sounds pretty sketchy, man. Like, you don't trust your... Best scouts on the fleet? Uh, well, I wouldn't say that, but, uh, anyway, it says here that you gave them a time machine. Oh, well, we weren't supposed to give them a time machine? No, you were you're not supposed to interact with them at all. No, we, we, we didn't interact with them, we gave them a time machine. Like, that's in, that's not interacting. That's just, that's like a gift. It's like giving something to somebody. That's literally interacting. Plus, that's not all you did. You did interact with them. You gave them a time machine. You showed up, you dressed in, like, a robe and pretended like you were a god and you handed them down a, a series of rules that they had to live by? I mean, what's what's wrong with that? They, they, they were, they were like, fucking, it was chaos down there. They were killing each other, they were eating each other, and we, we gave them some rules. We're like, here, you know, do this. That's stuff. literally the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do. You created a whole religion that has grown over the years to become the biggest, like, force on the planet, millions of people have died at the hands of this fictional guy that you created. I mean, that sounds pretty rough, and I'm very sorry, but in my defense, it was fucking hilarious. I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Andrew Price. 
This has been Deep Cuts. You can find me online at heydavebaker.com. Please go buy my book out now in stores everywhere from Dark Horse titled Everyone is Tulip. Andrew, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me using my four-story time machine to go back and either kill or fuck my mom. And you can also find me at dapricerights.com where you get my book, Deadbolt AI Private Eye. (laughs) That shit was intense. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. The incidental music for this episode was created by the Dead Boy Detectives.